Wir kommen nun als ersten Vortrag im Nachmittagspendel zu Tom Segev, der über Simon Wiesenthal and the Holocaust Memory in Israel sprechen wird. Tom Segev ist hierzulande, glaube ich, gut ein Begriff, nicht nur als Journalist und Beiträger zur israelischen Tageszeitung Haaretz und zur amerikanischen Tageszeitungen New York Times und Los Angeles Times, sondern er gilt auch, wie ich vor Jahren, vor mehr als zehn Jahren in Lingua Franca gelesen habe, als einer der New Historians in Israel mit einigen anderen Kollegen. <lacht> Nichtsdestoweniger gelten einige seiner Bücher kann ich sagen, als Klassiker mittlerweile. Ich möchte nur drei nennen. The Seventh Million, The Israelis and the Holocaust. One Palestine, Complete Jews and Arabs under the British Mandate. Und kürzlich, auch ins Deutsche übersetzt, wie die anderen Bücher. And the Americanization of Israel. Bitte. Dankeschön. Mir ist leichter, auf Englisch zu reden, aber die Fragen kann ich dann auch auf, äh, auf Deutsch äh, beantworten. In the summer of 1949, tens of thousands of Israelis took part in a very unusual event. The funeral of ashes that were said to belong to 200.000 Jews who were killed uh, in the concentration camps in Europe. These ashes were brought to uh, Israel from Austria. Never before or since were so many people laid to rest in a single burial ceremony. The timing of the funeral was peculiar too. Israel was less than two years old. The first war with the Arabs had uh, just come to an end. The country's existence was far from guaranteed Hundreds of thousands of immigrants poured into the country from Arab countries and from the DP camps in Germany and here in Austria, bringing with them nothing but economic and psychological misery. The major task confronting the new state was nation building, and the Holocaust had not yet been made part of that process. In fact, The Holocaust in those days was taboo. Parents wouldn't talk to their children about it, and children wouldn't dare to ask. What we have here is a social, political, and mostly psychological problem. And no one knew how to design national memory. Yad Vashem was struggling for money to pay the rent for a very small apartment, which was all it had in those days. In these circumstances, the mayor of Tel Aviv hardly knew what to do with a letter from Linz, which he received in October 1948, written in Yiddish and signed by one Simon Wiesenthal. He had no idea who Mr. Wiesenthal from Linz was. Der jüdische KZ-Verband in Estreich hat beschlossen, überzuschicken mit speziellen zwei Schlichen die drei Urnen mit dem Asch Gedächtnis von der Gdeusche. This is in Yiddish, which you write in Hebrew letters. And you notice the language, which would later, I think, characterize... This is not something we, the Jews in Austria, ask the Israelis to do. We are not seeking for Israel's advice. This is something we are informing you. We are informing you that this is what we have decided to do. And we expect you to respect our decision and know how the remains of 200,000 people should be laid to rest in a proper manner. Wiesenthal was a very decisive uh, man. and. Um, Very often, when he said we, he actually meant I. This may have been the first big Wiesenthal project. It certainly was the first major Holocaust-related event in Israel. 
The Central Zionist Archive in Jerusalem holds several files on the matter and they reflect great difficulty to organize such a funeral. There were conflicts between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Jerusalem saying, why should these ashes be laid to rest in Tel Aviv? They really belong to Jerusalem. There were conflicts between secular politicians and religious leaders. The question was, first of all, are these remains remains of humans at all? Are they remains of Jewish? Do they belong in a Jewish funeral? Do they belong in a Jewish ceremony? The question then was, what would the role of the chief rabbis be during that ceremony? Who will speak during the ceremony? What should we say? The mayor of Tel Aviv said, it's my event. I will be the talker. The chief rabbi said, no, excuse me, I'm the chief rabbi. So the mayor of Tel Aviv said, okay, we will invite President Chaim Weizmann to be the main speaker, and that's the way they did it. Then the uh, Jewish agency intervened and said, you know, you really have to postpone the event um, because um, um, due to the state funeral of the remains of Theodor Herzl, which were also transferred to Israel from Vienna. And for a moment, a conflict seemed to be created between Zionist memory and Holocaust memory. The remains of Theodor Herzl, of course, representing victory, the Wiesenthal ashes representing defeat. And in a way, this is what Israeli identity is really all about in these two poles. The Israeli memory keeps struggling between uh, defeat memory and, and victory memory. <coughs> affair, Wiesenthal naturally assumed that um, they would cover for the plane ticket. So Tel Aviv said to Jerusalem, you wanted the ceremony in Jerusalem, we'll have it in Jerusalem. Eventually, everything went well. The funeral became a national event, obviously heavily loaded uh, with emotion. And for Wiesenthal, this was the first time in Israel. I'm telling you all this in such great detail for a reason. For the past few weeks, I've been privileged to go through the papers of Simon Wiesenthal as he left them when he died. Huge amounts of material, most of it not yet put in any archival order. I'm able to do this uh, work thanks to the invitation of this uh, institute, the EFK, and I want to take this opportunity and express my deep gratitude, not only for the generosity of the EFK, but also for the very, very friendly hospitality. The material I'm working on, I understand, and we heard yesterday, is supposed to become the basis for a Wiesenthal Research Center. And since I'm probably the first person to gain such intimate knowledge of this material, I can say that this is a virtual treasure for historians. There are at least 20 PhD uh, dissertations there. Also, I find it hard to understand that Austria does not yet have a central institute for genocide and uh, Holocaust studies. So I'm in Vienna to understand Simon Wiesenthal, but my work has just started. And so the best I can do this afternoon is to share with you some thoughts and some methodological difficulties. For instance, I have often thought about the accuracy, the probability of Wiesenthal's memoirs. I guess the right word is credibility. One of the first problems I'm facing stems from the difficulty to find documented evidence for what we know from Wiesenthal himself. Obviously, Wiesenthal's life was quite exceptional. So much so that one is constantly inclined to say, hey, wait a minute, how could that be? 
For example, the detailed accounts of his survival. Time and again, he survived the very last moment in a very miraculous way. Once he was standing in a line waiting to be shot. Everybody in the line was shot. And just as they were supposed to shoot him, somebody comes running from the camp calling Wiesenthal, Wiesenthal. Turned out that this was the birthday of Adolf Hitler. Somebody in the camp remembered that Wiesenthal was an architect, so he obviously could draw a happy birthday sign. And so they take him out of the line, bring him back to the camp, make him <coughs> sign, uh, make him make that happy birthday sign. My problem with that story is that it exists in several versions, and there's an earlier version where it's not the birthday of Adolf Hitler, it's the birthday of a local couple in the camp. So I don't have big difficulty with that, only I make a mental note. Here is a man who tends to dramatize the story of his survival, and I find it quite extraordinary that a Holocaust survivor would feel the need to dramatize his, his story. And I think there's something to think about. Why is it that a, a survivor feels the need to dramatize uh, his story? Perhaps because he thinks that people won't believe it. People want to leave the simple story. But I'm not sure why this is. As I said, I'm sharing with you uh, some thoughts. But I made a mental note. Watch out. The man is dramatizing. Uh, his story. And Wiesenthal, by his own admission, time and again, conceals some pieces of information, particularly names, relying on his reader's willingness to respect his integrity and believe him. And I do. I do because again and again I remind myself that there was a time in Israel when people tended not to believe Holocaust survivors. <coughs> There's a very famous uh, story of a young man who comes to Israel and tells his relatives about um, his experiences in the camp. The uh, camp commander caught him, I think, stealing a piece of bread or something and punished him with 80 uh, blows, lashes, <coughs> or, or whippings or something. And he says it to his, to his family, and the family doesn't believe him. They say nobody can survive 80 whippings, and if that were true, you would probably not be alive, so you are lying to us. And this reaction of the family was to him the 81st blow. It's a very famous expression in Israel, um, symbolizing a whole period when people did not believe Holocaust survivors. And looking back, I remember this from my youth, but looking back at it, I think that uh, this, this tendency seems to me, in an, in, a, in an ironic way, almost a kind of Israeli Holocaust denial. But, and, and so I remember that when I, when I go through the Wiesenthal story. But as a journalist and historian, I find myself time and again applying to Wiesenthal the same standards of research which I would apply to everybody else. I want documented evidence. And thus, for instance, when I read in Wiesenthal's memoirs, that um, it was he who had initiated the 1949 funeral in Israel, I was rather skeptical. And I said, Wiesenthal, diploma engineer, DP camp, Linz, you have just come out of Mauthausen. How can you possibly make Israel arrange such a unusual, unique, kind of difficult? How is it possible? You are in Linz. Well, he was, and it's in the files. Zionist archive in Jerusalem holds another document which is interesting in connection with the controversy surrounding the capture of Adolf Eichmann. Now, by a strange coincidence, we really didn't plan it here in the, in, in, in the EFK, but precisely for our conference, this subject makes the main headline in the New York Times yesterday in Har all over the world in connection with some uh, CIA documents which were just released 
showing that the CIA knew back in 1958, that is to say two years before Eichmann was captured, that Eichmann was in fact residing in Argentina. Now, Wiesenthal never claimed that he was behind Eichmann's arrest in Argentina. But he did claim that as early as 1954, that is to say four years before the CIA, in 1954, he had received information that Eichmann was in fact residing in Argentina. Some of you may recall the story, how he met an Austrian baron uh, who was collecting stamps, just like himself. And um, <coughs> while the baron was showing off an envelope with uh, some stamps from Argentina on it, he also mentioned that the envelope contained a letter from a friend in Buenos Aires who had just met Eichmann. Again, I wish I could be sure that it was all as coincidental as Wiesenthal described it, and of course, perhaps it was. According to Wiesenthal, he passed the Baron's information on to the president of the World Jewish Congress, Nahum Goldman. Goldman, in effect, did nothing with that information. Many years later, Goldman was no longer alive. The World Jewish Congress officially denied that Goldman had ever received such a letter from Wiesenthal. Goldman, Goldman's papers are now open research in Jerusalem. And there it is, a letter from Wiesenthal dated March 30th, 1954, stating clearly that Eichmann was in Argentina, is in Argentina. There's no doubt about it. He knew it, he reported it. I want to contribute a speculation here. I think because why did, he, why did he write this to Goldman? He actually wrote it to Goldman in response to a question from Goldman. And Goldman did not approach Wiesenthal directly. Goldman approached the Israeli consul in Linz. And the consul said to Wiesenthal, Mr. Goldman is asking me about Eichmann. Why is he asking me about Eichmann? Because he wants some information which he, Goldman could pass on to the CIA because he wanted to establish some connection between the CIA. So Wiesenthal says, yes, I have just learned that Eichmann is in Argentina. And he writes this long report, he sends it to Goldman. My speculation is that the information the CIA comes from Goldman, comes from Wiesenthal. As I try to learn more about Wiesenthal's life, I take these two examples as a warning. Yes, it is a fantastic story, but although at least some of it is hard to believe, it must not be dismissed entirely as a fantasy. But take the sunflower. The sunflower is the name of a famous book which Wiesenthal wrote. I think it's out in 13 languages by now. And it's based on the following story. He is in the camp. A guard comes up to him and takes him to a nearby military hospital. They enter a room where a dying SS man is lying. And the dying SS man says to Wiesenthal, I can't die in peace before a Jew forgives me for my crimes against the Jewish people. Would you please forgive me? And Wiesenthal turns his back and leaves the room and does not forgive. And he made this story the basis for um, a worldwide discussion about the religious and philosophical aspects of forgiveness. What he did was to send the story to a large number of philosophers and writers all over the world and ask them for their comment. And together, this is the discussion of, of forgiveness, which is Yes, it's a good subject to, to discuss philosophically and, and religiously. Um, he received letters from all over the world asking him, is it true? And he answered, yes, it is true. By the way, he received a marvelous letter from Heinrich Böll, which I didn't know about because I think it's not in the book. I only discovered it in his files now, where Heinrich Böll tells him, if it's a true story, it's a marvelous account. and." It's great. If it's literature, it's very bad. 
<laughs> when he starts to make corrections like a teacher would make corrections on the composition of a, of a pupil. On line three, maybe you use the, the verb like this, or you put the sentence here, or you do this, or you do that. Now, how is it possible that a camp, com camp prisoner would be taken into the room of a dying SS man? Who ever heard of a dying SS man who needs forgiveness from a Jew? How did he know? The, the story then goes on, because he says that after the war, he went to, um, he traveled to Stuttgart. He looked at the mother of that dying SS man and told her about it. How did he know the name of the SS? How did he know the address of the mother? Did he remember it? Did he write it down? Or did he in a position to remember it? Why would he travel to Stuttgart to talk to her at all? One may adopt a postmodernistic attitude to some of these class writings and say, what difference does it make if it's true or not? What should interest us is the philosophical and religious discussion of uh, forgiveness. The huge Wiesenthal archive documents three major aspects of his activity. He was deeply involved in Austrian politics with at least two very dramatic climaxes, the Kreisky affair and the Waldheim debate. And I deliberately use the Austrian terms. Uh, I think it's no coincidence that the former is remembered as an affair and the latter as a debate. Notice that I said Kreisky affair. Others would say Wiesenthal affair. And it is a rather mysterious story to the present day. As you know, Kreisky charged Wiesenthal with collaboration with the Gestapo. And I'm not the first researcher, but I'm at present one of them who is making a great effort to find out what made Kreisky believe that. I'm assuming that Kreisky believed that. But what did he have on his desk to make such a charge? And it's impossible to find out. It's really impossible. There's one theory, I think somebody already mentioned this morning or, or yesterday, the name Theodor Oberländer was a, a, um, a West German uh, cabinet minister with SS uh, past. And it is possible that Kreisky assumed that in case he needs to go to court, this man Oberländer will uh, substantiate the claim that um, Wiesenthal had collaborated with the Gestapo. Why would Oberländer know that? I don't know why did Kreisky think that. I don't know. I can tell you that there is, in fact, a Theodor Oberlander file held by the Kreisky archive here in Vienna. And I went to see it. And they were very nice. They took it out. They put it on the table. And it is empty. There is nothing in it. So I'm still trying to understand where did that uh, charge come from. It is an extremely um, fascinating um, conflict between, I think, two very, two Jews with very big egos in a very small town called Vienna. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to, to understand. Then there is Wiesenthal, the Nazi hunter. He hated that term. In fact, he almost sued somebody for using that term. But then his lawyer told you, excuse me, you published a book called Ich jagte Eichmann, so you really can't sue this man anymore. But still, he hated uh, that thing. And those of you who went to the Wiesenthal offices yesterday, and some of you went uh, today, you know that it was not a CIA center, it was not a Mossad <laughs> center. Wiesenthal hardly ever sent out secret agents anywhere. In fact, I'm inclined to say that he was no hunter at all. He was a man hunted by the Holocaust. And it is, in fact, a very sad story. I also tend to think of him as a collector. He collected names and dates and figures and files and stamps. 
Wiesenthal gained most of his information from newspapers, from telephone books, from letters he wrote to registration authorities in various countries. And he received quite a lot of unsolicited information from all kinds of people, some of it not worth anything. He tended to uh, mark a lot of mail he got with the letter M for Mishun. <laughs> and, um, but um, he received lots of information, and this is one reason why he made such extensive use of the media. The more famous he became, the more information people would send to him. And I would say that most of the significant successes resulted from this kind of information, not from any secret agents he sent out anywhere. And I would also say that um, the number of disappointments exceeds by far the number of successes. What interests me most about Wiesenthal is the role he played in shaping the Holocaust memory in Israel and in the world. His role was quite significant, and at least in regard to Israel, it was also quite ironic. Because over the years, Israel sought to become the sole, or at least the main moral authority on Holocaust lessons. And the Holocaust also, with, with, from over the years, became a major component of the Israeli identity. Wiesenthal, in the meantime, worked hard to prevent the world from sinking the Holocaust into oblivion. The Holocaust became a universal code of ultimate evil, largely due to Wiesenthal's work. But as a result of this development, Israel lost its self-proclaimed monopoly on the Holocaust heritage, much to its dismay. Wiesenthal's approach to the Holocaust was often too universal for the Israelis. For instance, there were differences of opinion between Yad Vashem and Wiesenthal concerning the proper way to remember the extermination of the Sinti and Roma. Wiesenthal encouraged the memory of other groups of victims, the mentally retarded, the homosexuals, the Jehovah's Witnesses, he was involved in struggles against racism and, and violations of human rights, including a long and successful struggle to call a street in Berlin after Jesse Owens, the black athlete. And he tried to help the Indians in Latin America. In this connection, he wrote a very angry letter to the Israeli ambassador in Vienna Israel, he wrote, should be more aware of the use Latin American countries are making with the weapons they buy from Israel. It is quite noticeable, however, that he never criticized Israel's human rights violations on the Palestinian territories. But he was quite active uh, in the Bosnia crisis. So it is a rather complex story. <laughs> As I walk along the shelves of Wiesenthal's deserted office, I can visualize the drama <coughs> of his life. Starting with the 1945 files, I meet a skeleton, really, who hardly knows where to begin life again. Walking on along the shelf, perhaps 10 meters or so, 50 years or so, <coughs> I come across a little note in English saying, Simon Darling, take care of Elizabeth Taylor, that is. So as a Holocaust celebrity, the story of Simon Wiesenthal raises the question, why is it that the Western world needed that kind of moral hero, and why now? Again, it is a question that at this stage of my work, I would have to leave hanging in the air, but I'm still looking for the answer. Thank you very much.
Schutter Kreisky in diesem Fall Affäre, so wird sie nicht genannt, möchte ich sagen, dass, also ich glaube, es war schon, äh, also nach, ich weiß nicht, ob es knapp vor dem Tod oder nach dem Tod von Kreisky, das kann ich mich nicht erinnern, aber diesen Fall hat auch, also ganz öffentlich und klar erklärt, dass das eine Fehlinformation des polnischen und ostdeutschen Geheimdienstes war. Und er hat sozusagen im Nachhinein den Kreisky entschuldigt, dass er dieser Fehlinformation aufgesessen ist. Also das nur... Es gibt in dem äh, Wiesenthal-Archiv die Stasi-Akte, die äh, Wiesenthal sich hat kommen lassen. Und da würde man ja meinen, dass wenn die Polen etwas gewusst hätten, wusste es vielleicht die Stasi auch. Die schlimmste Anschuldigung in der Stasi-Akte ist, dass der Wiesenthal amerikanischer Agent war. Ja. Aber schlimmer konnte man es, haben sie sich nichts erfunden können, die, die DDR. Also, also ähm, ich kann Ihnen sagen, dass es überhaupt keine einen Anfang von Beweis gibt, dass der Wiesenthal irgendwie äh, eine andere Geschichte hatte, eine äh, Überlebensgeschichte, als er geschrieben hat ja, in seinem Buch. Aber das hängt so in der Luft. Was Nein, aber hat der Wiesenthal hat eben das auch also behauptet, ja. dass die Information, die der Kreisky aufgrund dessen er ihn beschuldigt hat, eine, Fehl, eine gezielte Fehlinformation ja der Stasi und des polnischen Geheimdienstes ja, ist, um, weil er natürlich mit den Amerikanern, das war kein Geheimnis, zusammengearbeitet hat. Ja, vielleicht. Das, das ist möglich. Das habe ich gemeint. Ja, vielleicht. Weitere Wortmeldungen? Ich kann Ihnen erzählen, dass ich mal den Kreisky interviewt habe über diesen Tag. Erst haben wir ein formelles Interview gemacht und dann hat er gesagt, so ist jetzt das formelle Interview zu Ende, dann möchte ich Ihnen was erklären. Und dann, ich war mit einem Kollegen da und dann hat er uns zweieinhalb Stunden lang vorgetragen, dass es kein jüdisches Volk ist. Das hat er ganz schön historisch vorbereitet gehabt mit Büchern und mit, äh, mit äh, äh, Zitaten. Und äh, er hatte so einen Haufen von Büchern. Und immer wenn er eins hochgehoben hat, dann war unten eine angegessene Mozartkugel. Also, wir <lacht> genau sehen, wie er das vorbereitet hat, das, äh, das äh, Gespräch. Und äh, wir haben ihn anderthalb Stunden sprechen lassen. Und, dann habe ich ihn gewagt zu fragen, Herr Bundeskanzler, gibt es eigentlich ein österreichisches Volk? Und wenn ja, können Sie uns vielleicht sagen, seit wann? Und dann ist er wieder in die Luft explodiert. Und er hat gesagt, mein Großvater, der war schon zu Napoleons Zeiten und so. Also die, die, der Konflikt ist wirklich sehr, sehr interessant, weil der noch andauert. Das ist ein Konflikt über die Frage, wer Jude ist, was das bedeutet, Jude zu sein ob man Jude sein kann, ohne Zionist zu sein, ob man Zionist sein kann, ohne in Israel zu leben. Und das ist ein Komplex, den ich glaube, beide dieser Männer sehr stark gelebt haben, auch Kreisky und sowohl Kreisky, auch Kreisky als auch Wiesenthal. Der Wiesenthal hat ja auch nicht in Israel gelebt. Also er war einer der Juden, die woanders leben. Eine Frage, die man ihm immer gestellt hat, ich glaube, dass man sie jedem Juden in Österreich stellt, ist, warum leben sie eigentlich in Österreich? Und äh, es gibt einen Brief unter den Briefen, in dem er diese Frage beantwortet. Ich glaube, jemanden in Amerika, der sagt, ja, in Israel gibt es ja nicht genug Nazis, die ich hätte suchen können. <lacht> Aber das ist wirklich eine, eine Frage, die, die, äh, die sehr tief ist eigentlich. Wie, wieso, was bedeutet das eigentlich? Und, und also die, die, das Bestreben, eine Alternative zum Zionismus äh, darzustellen, ohne sich schuldig zu fühlen, ohne zu fühlen, dass man, ohne sich zu, zu entschuldigen dafür, dass man eben nicht Zionist ist. Also das war, das ist alles sehr, sehr interessant. Ich glaube, dass dieser Kapitel viel interessanter ist als die Waldheim-Affäre, obwohl die Waldheim-Debatte, wenn Sie wollen, obwohl hier wieder der Wiesenthal sich ausgerechnet 
im Konflikt mit, wieder mit Juden finde. Hier war das der Kreisky und hier ist das der World Jewish Congress. Ja. Äh, und das ist wirklich interessant, wie die, er, er, er sagt dann immer, ich kann, ich kann mich gegen Nazis wehren, ich kann mich gegen Neonazis wehren, aber wieso finde ich mich immer im Konflikt mit Juden? Nächster ja. Redner, Herr Wind. Ich wollte noch etwas nochmal unterstreichen mit der Tätigkeit von Simon Wiesenthal, gerade in Bezug jetzt auf die Meldung zu Eichmann, dass es ja in diesen Berichten heute, finde ich, schon etwas, sagen wir mal, zumindest die Schwierigkeiten weit minimiert werden, die es bedeutet haben, damals jemand wie Eichmann überhaupt ausfindig zu machen. Also in Buenos Aires, wo es kein Telefonbuch gibt, jemand ausfindig zu machen, der entweder Clemens oder Clement heißt, dann zu identifizieren, ob dieser Mensch, wenn man den überhaupt finden könnte, tatsächlich jener Adolf Eichmann ist, nach dem man sucht. Also, wenn ich richtig in Erinnerung habe, nach dem Buch von Issa Harel, gab es zwei Mossad-Expeditionen nach ja. Buenos Aires, wobei die erste fast gescheitert wäre, weil eben die Informationen derjenige, ja. der sich nachher als Eifamilie Clement Eichmann herausgestellt hat, aus dem Haus ausgezogen ist, das mühsam herausgefunden worden ist. Also, das, ähm, die Meldungen, die heute mit dem, mit dem CIA oder sozusagen in den Zeitungen stehen, suggerieren ein wenig, als würde man, wenn man wissen, wenn man wüsste äh, oder äh, die Information hätte, dass jemand unter dem Namen Clemens in Argentinien in Buenos Aires lebt und dass Eichmann es nur einfach hinzugehen braucht, um ihn rauszuholen oder ihn zu verhaften zu lassen äh, mit, äh, mit Interpol, dass das nicht der Wirklichkeit entspricht, die Ende der 50er Jahre und Anfang der 60er Jahre Tatsächlichkeit war. Und da jemand wie Wiesenthal wirklich richtig Puzzlesteinchen wie Fritz Bauer geleistet hat, um das Stück für Stück zusammenzusetzen und wir nicht in Rasterfahren, die Zeiten der Rasterfahndung und Interpol. Äh, das stimmt, aber es ist wieder wichtig zu sagen, dass er sich niemals dafür, er hat niemals behauptet, dass er äh, maßgebend war für die Fahndung. Er hat immer nur gesagt, und ich glaube, dass das auch stimmt, dass seine Haupt äh, äh, Contribution darin Liegt, bitte, äh, ja, sein Hauptverdienst liegt darin, dass er vermieden hat, irgendwann in den 50er Jahren, dass die Frau Eichmann den Eichmann als tot erklärt. Und dadurch ist eigentlich dieser Mann auf den Listen geblieben. Dann, wie gesagt, hat er gewusst, dass er in Argentinien ist. Ähm, es gab dann in Argentinien einen jüdischen Einwanderer, der... Äh, dem es klar geworden ist, dass seine Tochter sich mit dem Sohn vom Eichmann befreundet. Der hat dann dem Staatsanwalt Bauer geschrieben. Der Staatsanwalt Bauer hat sich an Israel gewendet. Und Israel hat sich sehr, sehr wenig interessiert dafür, Eichmann oder überhaupt äh, frühere Nazis äh, vor Gericht zu stellen. Der israelische Mossad und war ebenso wie äh, ganz Israel eine sehr zukunftsorientierte Organisation. Israel war eine zukunftsorientierte äh, äh, Gesellschaft. Die haben sich überhaupt nicht interessiert für alte Nazis. Und dann, kam, dann haben sie aber eben, wie Sie sagten, die beiden Agenten nach Argentinien geschickt. Der Eichmann war nicht zu Hause. Dann sind sie zurückgekommen und haben gesagt, er wohnt da nicht. Und dann sind noch zwei Jahre vergangen. Unterdessen hat der Bauer noch mehr Informationen bekommen. Dann ist er wieder zu Israel gekommen und hat gesagt, Jetzt kann ich diese Information nicht mehr für mich behalten. Ich muss sie jetzt meiner Regierung weitergeben, wenn ihr ihn nicht kriegt. Und dann haben sie doch nochmal geschickt und den Rest äh, kennen wir ja. Aber das ist nicht etwa so, dass Israel sich furchtbar große Mühe gegeben hat. Und das war für Wesenthal auch, wenn wir jetzt über die Biografie von Wesenthal, er fühlte sich oft sehr einsam in diesen äh, Bemühungen, äh, die Leute ausfindig zu machen. Ich dachte aber, Sie werden was anderes sagen, weil Sie vorher über die Gerichte gesprochen haben. Das hätte ich vielleicht auch noch sagen können. Das haben wir auch gerade jetzt eben gesehen. Wieder. Wir waren jetzt gerade bei ein bisschen Akten so geguckt, der, der Omer Bartor und ich. Also man sieht, wie maßgebend der äh, Wesenthal war. Als man schon mal jemanden verhaftet hat, da hat man ja überhaupt kein Beweismaterial mehr. Also zum Beispiel die, die, diese Verbrecher von Botschaft. Die kann man ja gar nicht vor Gericht stellen, wenn der Wesenthal sich nicht an die ganze Welt wendet und noch und noch und noch Briefe schreibt und bittet ähm, Aussagen. Das ist jetzt nicht mehr, einen, einen geheimen Agent in die Welt zu schicken und den zu fangen. Der ist schon verhaftet, aber wenn wir nicht die Aussagen finden, 
und das ist interessant, wie die ganzen Aussagen von der israelischen Polizei, die an das deutsche Gericht äh, gerichtet sind, die gehen durch Wien, die gehen durch das Zentrum von Wiesenthal. Also es ist schon ein Zentrum für die Sammlung von äh, Beweismaterial und äh, es gibt eine Unzahl von Briefen, die er aus Ludwigsburg kriegt, von diesen Staatsanwälten. Also die, die tun ihn schon äh, äh, anerkennen als Autorität, als Seite in ihrem, äh, als, als Partner in, in ihren Bemühungen. Das ist schon interessant, seine Rolle äh, und das ist ja eigentlich der, der Kern der der, der Philosophie von, von Wiesenthal, der Glaube, darüber habe ich schon heute früh gesprochen, ich war der Glaube an das liberale Gerichtssystem. Da ist er immer wieder äh, enttäuscht. Es gibt den Mora-Prozess hier in, in Österreich, der, der dann immer wieder furchtbar enttäuscht ist, mit so viel Energie steckt drin und dann kommt nichts dabei raus. Aber manchmal auch ja. Ich habe leider den Anfang Ihres Referats nicht gehört und vielleicht haben Sie darüber gesprochen. Die Frage geht in diese Richtung. Ähm, es gab immer eine Spannung zwischen den Historikern und den Überlebenden. Und ähm, wie sehen Sie die Rolle von Simon Wiesenthal? Und gerade, weil mehr und mehr wird gesagt, ja, jetzt die Überlebenden sterben aus und jetzt gibt es eine neue Generation und man muss das anders angehen. Äh, wie sehen Sie die Rolle von Wiesenthal gerade auf diesen Schnittpunkt zwischen Überlebende, die also betroffen sind auch ja. durch ihre Biografie und Historiker. Ich glaube, dass die äh, Holocaust-Erinnerung und der Holocaust als Code, als weltweiter Code des ultimativen Bösen nicht bedingt ist von <lacht> lebenden Holocaust-Überlebenden. Ich glaube, dass das jetzt schon ein, äh, ein, ein, eine Kraft für sich äh, hat und das bleibt erhalten auch wenn es keine Überlebenden mehr gibt. Es gibt übrigens noch sehr viele Überlebende. In Israel gibt es allein 200.000 Holocaust-Überlebende, die übrigens interessanterweise Kinder waren. Und deshalb die ganze Holocaust-Auffassung in Israel hat sich dahingehend geändert, dass man heute oft neigt, den Holocaust als ein Verbrechen gegen Kinder zu verstehen. Ja, ich sehe, ja. Weil, weil, weil die Holocaust-Überlebenden heute besonders äh, Kindererfahrungen erzählen. Aber ähm, ich glaube, dass ähm, der Holocaust wirklich ein, eine, 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 die, die, die Heritage, Holocaust, die Holocaust Heritage, die Holocaust Memory, die hat heute wirklich eine Kraft, eine moralische Kraft äh, als äh, Quelle für humanistische Werte, äh, die schon für sich dasteht. Also das liegt nicht mehr an, an äh, an Überlebenden und ich glaube, dass Wiesenthal wirklich sehr viel dafür getan hat, in der Richtung die, die Holocaust-Erinnerung in die Richtung zu treiben. Also gerade weil er immer von anderen Opfergruppen gesprochen hat und äh, weil er sich immer geweigert hat, zum Beispiel äh, kollektiv Schuld irgendwem äh, zu, zu, an, an zu, wie sagt man, an, Anzulasten. Anzulasten, ja. Also, also nicht den Deutschen, nicht den Österreichern, nicht den Ukrainern. Also es ist sehr individualistisch. Das führt in, die, in, in den Individualismus des, des, des 20. Jahrhunderts und, und führt schließlich auch zu dem ähm, Gerichtshof in Haag, wo man auch sagt, man muss genau wissen, was er gemacht hat und man muss es genau beweisen. Es ist nicht genug, dass er Staatsmann war von einem verbrecherischen Regime. Man muss genau wissen, was er Gemacht. Das ist sehr, glaube ich, äh, der, der Wiesenthal hat, hat diese Werte schon, schon viel früher äh, propagiert und äh, er war sehr, sehr gut mit den Medien, äh, und, und, ähm, aber wie gesagt, nicht äh, aus irgendwelchen, weil, weil, er, weil er daraus berühmt wäre oder, oder reich geworden wäre, sondern äh, wie gesagt, weil das berühmte, so berühmter er würde, wurde, desto mehr Informationen äh, kam. Ich wollte noch mal was fragen zur Persönlichkeit von Simon Wiesenthal. Sie haben eingangs gesagt, 
ähm, er, er hatte schon eine gewisse Kompromisslosigkeit. Also er hat oft we ah. gesagt und I gemeint. Oder er hat ja. gegenüber diesem Bürgermeister in Tel Aviv gesagt, ja. äh, macht dieses Begräbnis nicht, mhm. könnt ihr dieses Begräbnis machen. Also mhm. diese Kompromisslosigkeit, ähm, ändert sich das im Laufe seines Wirkens auch gegenüber Israel? Und woher kommt das? Leitet er das ab aus ähm, dem Eintreten für die Rechte der Ermordeten? Also ist das das starke Movens, so stark aufzutreten? Ähm, und muss er das vielleicht auch, damit er was erreicht, weil er anders gar nichts erreichen wird? Oder gibt es da eine Wandlung, also durchläuft eine Wandlung irgendwie in seinem... Also ich kann, Ihnen noch, ich, ich kann mit Ihnen noch eine Schwierigkeit teilen, die mich natürlich besonders interessiert als, äh, als Israeli. Äh, wir haben ausgerechnet, dass da in, auf den Regalen Kopien von vielleicht 300.000 äh, Briefe stehen und nicht, dass ich sie alle gesehen habe, aber ich habe wirklich viele Stunden schon investiert. Es gibt kaum was über Israel. Das ist furchtbar interessant. Es gibt kaum was im Bereich der Kritik etwa an Menschenrechtsverletzungen von Israel in den palästinensischen Gebieten. Davon wäre natürlich auch nichts zu erwarten. Vielleicht, weil Wiesenthal schon früher, noch vor dem Krieg, zu der eher rechten nationalistischen äh, Strömung in der zionistischen Bewegung gehört hat, die Jabotinsky-Bewegung. Ähm, er hätte wohl, wenn er in Israel wäre, Likud gewählt. Äh, er war manchmal zum Abendbrot eingeladen beim Begin, wenn er in Israel war. Ähm, das war seine, seine Richtung und eigentlich in Österreich war er ja auch eher rechtsgerichtet als, als SPÖ und das ist natürlich auch ein Grund, warum er, er diesen Streit mit dem, mit dem Kreisky hat. Ähm, aber es gibt nur sehr wenig, äh, das ist wirklich ein Thema, ich kann nicht genau beantworten, was hat er eigentlich gedacht äh, von Israel. Er hat äh, Israel verteidigt, so wie äh, äh, so die meisten Juden in, in, in der Welt äh, Israel verteidigen, damit ist gemeint die Existenz Israel, die Verteidigung, das Recht zu verteidigen und so. Aber was er eigentlich im Einzelnen gedacht hat zu äh, etwa der Siedlungspolitik, der militärischen Politik, der Gesellschaft in Israel. Das weiß ich nicht so genau. Das ist äh, aber wirklich ein, eine Schwierigkeit, weil es so wenig... Ich dachte, es wird viel mehr geben. Ich erinnere mich, am ersten Tag, als ich äh, zu Ihnen gekommen bin, habe ich zuerst gefragt, äh, was haben Sie eigentlich über Israel? Und dann haben wir die Pfeil, den Pfeil Israel rausgenommen. Da sind äh, Zeitungsartikel drin. Da ist eigentlich... Es ist schwer zu sagen, was er eigentlich gedacht hat von Israel. Yeah. Um, you, you quoted uh, Wiesenthal uh, earlier saying that he chose to live in Austria rather than in Israel because that's where there were more Nazis. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in what you think about the following. You uh, postulate that Wiesenthal played an important role in the manner in which uh, the Holocaust uh, was increasingly treated uh, in the world as an issue that had to do with justice, with the, with the pursuit of specific perpetrators, with finding evidence, and with bringing them to court. Um, and I'm interested, what, what do you make of the fact that he was doing all of that as, you know, first as a young man and then as an old man sitting in a little office in Vienna in a country which took longer than most other countries to come to terms with its own past to the extent that even now it is still, as we know, debating the creation of such a center. Right. Uh, how, how would that fit into your understanding of his role to the extent the that way I, The way I... I um, I formulated that question would be, uh, I wonder, how did he think of himself as an Austrian, uh, perhaps as a Count K Austrian, <laughs> as, a, as a young, he, he was born in, in, in Galicia, in Buchach, but as a young boy, he came to Vienna and went to school in Vienna for a while, for several years. So he must have thought of himself perhaps as a Viennese, if there is a Viennese identity, I'm not sure, but perhaps, but um, he spent, I, I tell you one, one, one step that I think made his, his, uh, his Austrian life possible. He started um, 
as an employee of American organizations. Uh, first, he worked with the American intelligence, chasing Nazis immediately after the war. So he wasn't really Austrian. He was living in the Austrian zone of occupation, and, and he dealt with the Americans. He then worked for Ot, which is an international Jewish organization. He worked for the JDC, which is a joint uh, uh, organization for, for many years. And so that may have made it possible, perhaps. Then he went to Vienna, uh, started to work with the Jewish community in Vienna. And like uh, most often in his life, he got in some kind of conflict with the Jewish community in Vienna. And in the meantime, Eichmann was captured. And so he restarted, um, yes, the business of, of looking for Nazis. And so um, he was already here. I think um, it's, it's not um, an ideological or a conscious decision, I'm staying in, in, in Austria. He, he probably just yeah. stayed here. Yeah. If, I, if I just follow, follow up on that, what, what I really meant was, was, was not simply his own psychology, but the fact that the man who had established a certain way of dealing with the Holocaust was living in a country that had not established that way. So when you think about his, not, not his psychology as to why he stayed, but rather the relationship between his presence here and what was going on all around him, to the extent that he was more influential <coughs> elsewhere I understand. than to Hauser. I, yes, I That's understand that uh, he had a very difficult time in Austria, especially at the beginning. At the very end, of course, he was an Austrian icon. Okay, uh, very, very late. He was already very, very sick. The president of Austria came to his house and presented him with some um, honor, okay? Um, just before that, the Queen of Britain had presented him with some kind of citation. Not in person, but the British ambassador came in. So he was already, but during the Kreisky time, if, if you look at those those, uh, those threatening letters which he got. There are thousands of letters. I happened to see uh, uh, a threatening letter that uh, contains a little piece of soap in the letter, actually. And he got thousands and thousands of, of threatens. There was, as you know, uh, there was also a bomb which was planted at, at his house and, and uh, he was constantly guarded by, by the police. So he was never part of the Austrian, he was never part of the Austrian society. And, and um, on the other hand, uh, and this is again something which I, at the beginning, tended to doubt. In his memoirs, he keeps talking about informers, Austrian informers. Uh, he keeps talking about informers in Alt Aussee, where Eichmann um, was hiding for a while, and Mrs. Eichmann was residing for a while. And he keeps talking, my informers there told me this and my informers told me that. And it doesn't sound very plausible in, 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 the, in, the, um, in the memoirs. Why would you have informers? You, 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 you are, you are a lonely man in, an, in, in a small office in, in Vienna. I mean, you are not the Mossad. I know you are not the Mossad. You pretend to be, but you're not. Why would you have? Well, he did have an <laughs> informer. Um, who was a retired uh, gendarmerie commander in that little village who did send him information about Mrs. Eichmann out of a conviction, a leftist gendarmerie man who thought this is the man Wiesenthal who wants to capture Eichmann and I will help him. How do we know that? Because there are all the letters there, the man called Tara, there are all the letters there. And, and it is exactly the way he says it in his memoirs. Mrs. Eichmann comes in, Mrs. Eichmann goes out, there is a guest coming, there is a car parking, she takes the children out of school, she puts the children in. There's a constant following of the everyday life of the Eichmann family. And it all comes from this gendarmerie man in Alt Aussee. So again, it's not all fantasy. There is something to it. <laughs> and so. He did have at least this one informer. 
So uh, some people, at least in Austria, did, I think rightfully, uh, uh, feel proud of the fact that they do have somebody like that uh, operating in Austria. I don't think that most Austrians felt that way, but at least some did. Zwei kurze Wortmeldungen, Herr Banki und der Herr bei der Kamera, Herr Roth, ein andermal. Okay, so I'll be short. Also, it's one comment and one question. The comment regards this Eichmann case, uh, and I would say that any, anyone acquainted with the topography of that place, San Fernando, where Eichmann was captured, mm -hmm. uh, realizes that the description given by the, by the captures, by, by the Aroni, who now lives in Essex or Sussex or whatever, yes. in this interview given to the BBC, is totally absurd and totally unplausible. Mm -hmm. uh, what he says there cannot have happened in the way he describes it. So Just tell the, author, uh, the audience that you're talking about the former Mossad agent. Yeah, former Mossad okay. agent that tells right. how, how it was done and this is absolutely right. impossible and I don't want, because of the lack of time, right. to explain. Because the Mossad agents also fight with each other. Who did more than yeah. to explain, right. to explain why? They all write books. Uh, just to give a hint, you know, that place is more or less today when you watch television, you can see where Maradona started playing. It's, it's a shanty town. Can you imagine in a shanty town someone comes and starts speaking English with a, with, with a German accent, claiming that he's an American businessman, and Eichmann's daughter opens the door and she understands English. And, but this is total nonsense. Nobody speaks English in a shanty town and so on. But that's, let, that's the comment. Now, the question is more serious. And I would like now to focus not on, on Wiesenthal, but on the, on, I would say, the Rezeptionsgeschichte. Uh, up to a certain point in time, Eri Wiesel doesn't exist. Up to a certain point in time, Primo Levi doesn't exist. And from a certain moment onward, these become the epitomes of, of, of Holocaust in different fields. Uh, uh, so the question with, since when is Wiesenthal Wiesenthal and not an eccentric living in, in, in Austria and doing a, a, a job of a crank? And does it, do you find a chronological correlation with the acceptance of Primo Levi, of Eli Wiesel as major figures for an event that becomes part and parcel the Western civilization in the second half of the century? As I said, this is a question which I want to leave hanging in the air because I'm still working on it. But I think that Wiesenthal <coughs> uh, became very well known surprisingly early. I think that immediately after the capture of Eichmann in 1960, uh, Wiesenthal became a very common name in the international media. He went to America almost every year or twice a year he gave lectures, he was, uh, his books were published in many languages, and it was well known that he exists. This is different, perhaps, than his position in Austria. I think that his position in Austria caught on <coughs> later, as a result of his international reputation. But um, in, in, uh, in, in America, especially, and in other countries, uh, he was quite well known uh, quite early, well known as somebody who hunts Nazis, as a hunter. As, an, as a human rights authority, I think it became much later, perhaps uh, as late as the 1970s and perhaps in connection with the Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. There was a very uneasy relationship between the Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles and between Simon Wiesenthal in Vienna. But I think that one thing the uh, Los Angeles Center did do for Wiesenthal was to raise him into the status of a human rights, um, of an internationally known human rights um, personality. Um, and the interesting thing, of course, is that at about the same time, the same thing happened to Elie Wiesel. And we talked about it, uh, Professor Hilberg, yesterday at dinner. Uh, when did it happen and why did it happen? It's very difficult to, uh, to point the finger and say why did the world need uh, these kind of, 
of human rights heroes who are related to the Holocaust, but I think it's something to work on, and I'm still working on. Jetzt die Frage ganz kurz. Für die ist das ganz kurz. Habe ich das richtig verstanden? So. Dass Fritz Bauer seine Kenntnisse über Eichmann nicht an die äh, bundesrepublikanische Behörde weitergeleitet hat. Warum hat er das getan? Er hat sie nur weitergeleitet an den, ähm, an den äh, sozialdemokratischen äh, Ministerpräsident von Hessen. Hessen. Ich habe jetzt den Namen im Moment vergessen, mit dem L fängt es an. Das war der Einzige, der es wusste. Und er hat gewusst, dass wenn es eine Regierung gibt, dann wird die Regierung auf diplomatischen Wege von Argentinien die Ausweisung von Eichmann bitten. Und währenddessen wird der Eichmann die Wege von Mengele und von Bormann gehen. Und Bormann nicht, aber Mengele und irgendwo verschwinden. Und äh, deshalb hat der, Bormann, hat der, hat der Bauer äh, wirklich etwas... Äh, eigentlich seiner, seiner Verpflichtung als, als Beamter äh, gegen das getan. Er ist einfach zu den Israelis gegangen und hat gesagt, ihr müsst ihn holen. Aber deshalb war es ihm auch so dringend. Länger kann ich nicht warten. Entweder ihr holt ihn jetzt oder wir holen, oder ihr holt ihn. Also das ist wirklich eine sehr, sehr interessante Figur, die, der, der Fritz Bauer. Auch eine Biografie wert. Es gibt eine, die eine wird gerade geschrieben von der Frau Royer. Das ist sehr interessant. Danke, Tom. Ich danke auch.